सर खड़े होके खड़े होके खड़े प्लीज स्टैंड नहीं थैंक यू Amongst uh, the commercial films that Chawla and Jalwa and all that, I also made a film called uh, Banaras: A Mystic Love Story, in which Nasiruddin Shah played uh, Mahabhar Babaji. That was a part of the search, which then introduced me to a lot of people who came forward and uh, invited me and uh, some avatars and some highly evolved spiritual people. So the search goes on. I'm also doing the Bollywood side. I'm not going to stop that. Uh, like him, uh, we delve into a lot of creativity, and which I think is a path uh, to oneness and Saraswati blesses us and all that. And he's a great wildness, so and he's also a spirituality. So there's something common about him. Uh, what fascinates me about this book is that this this is not it's not a religion. It is beyond all religions. So now uh, I ask him to speak onward after this. Thank you. Heartfulness is all about living a life that is centered in the heart. Life that is centered in the source of our existence, which we discover in the heart. I have been quoting a lot lately this one line from the Gita, from Dhyana Yoga, where Lord Krishna says, I am in the heart of all created things. But at the same time, while this is true, from our very limited perspective, we could now argue and say, can something of this nature, something of this level, as, some, as the divine, could it be located in any one place at all? Could it be limited to your heart? Because we also say that God is everywhere, that God is omnipresent. So what is this uniqueness about the heart that Lord Krishna says, I'm there? Why not everywhere else? Is that what he's saying? I don't think so. He's saying that he's not everywhere else. I think the uniqueness of the heart and what I've understood from my own practice and from my interactions with my guide, my guru, Daji, is that the heart is the organ of feeling. And such things as the ultimate, such things as God, they can only be perceived through feeling. We cannot apply the mind and successfully perceive this presence. Because if it is absolute, then we'll never be able to grasp it. Because the human mind can only understand comparative objects. It understands the concept of high because it's comparing high to something that's low, or understands something small by comparing it to something which is bigger. So by contrasting things, it is able to grasp. So this is the relativity of the mind. So what about something which we call the absolute? which has no limitation. So there I think the mind gets defeated in its attempts to understand. And that's why we go to the heart. Because even if it can't be known, even if God can't be known, God can be experienced. And this experience comes through feeling. And the heart is the organ of feeling. So by resting our awareness and centering or finding the center, the core of our consciousness within our heart. Now we become able to experience that presence. And because of that presence, consciousness, mind, 
also. Consciousness and its components now become revolutionized. It is this contact between the divine and the mind, which is allow us to have various experiences along our spiritual journey. And so, through meditation, we learn to refer to the heart. We learn to center ourselves in the heart. And because of the way that our mind and our understanding is affected by this contact within, this deeper contact within, we are now able to discriminate clearly and understand clearly and know what we should do, what we should not do, which paths to take, which paths to avoid in our lives. So we become guided. Our lives become very much like this, to refer to the Gita, the Gita again, this symbol which appears in so many places of the chariot and the driver and, of course, Arjun sitting there, sitting there or standing there as a passenger because that's what we become like. We become passengers when the driving is being done by someone else. And so we can understand that this driving of our lives is being done by someone else when we are able to receive such inspiration and signals from within that automatically translate into inspired thoughts and show us and make us understand and lead us through our lives. At first, in fact, we're not passengers at all. At first, it's like guidance and we can choose whether or not to follow that guidance. We can choose. It's up to us. We can reject it. We can accept it. And uh, there is a quote in this book, because Daji once said that if we choose not to follow the signals that emerge from within, then he said, no, no practice can help you. No guru can help you. Look, then in that case, even God can't help you. And I asked him why, why he says this. And he, his reply was that it's easy to wake up a sleeping person, but you can't wake up somebody who's only pretending to sleep. Okay? So when we're able to receive, we have wisdom, and then we choose not to follow that wisdom, that's another story altogether. So this is all becomes about willingness. Willingness and trust of the, what we receive from inside. And this trust only comes through repeated experiences. Because when you have a friend, and you, know, you realize over time, through your own experiences, that yes, this friend of mine is reliable, I can trust this person. Okay, now your experience has led you to a state of trust. So in the same way, when we are receiving intuition, and we follow that intu intuition just once, maybe twice, then we see, aha, it's valuable. Now we are looking for it, and now we have the confidence to follow it again and again. And then with that confidence, eventually comes this total trust, this total surrender. And then we don't need to consider and discriminate every time whether, is this correct, is this incorrect? <coughs> then it just starts happening automatically, it becomes habitual. So you lose this self-consciousness in all of this. You lose this, what is this self-consciousness? It's this ego that everybody always talks about. So this sort of referring to the heart can take us many places, take us very far. And, uh, and this book is all about some very specific practices, very simple practices, which help us along the way, meditation something we call cleaning. I think that's a unique practice. And uh, prayer, which everybody knows about. And something very essential, which we call yoga transmission. 
cleaning is something which is very important because if you're trying to maintain, or rather if you're trying to establish contact with that presence within yourself, when we close our eyes and say, okay, now let me center myself in the heart. At that moment, do you find that presence that's been spoken of in the Gita and elsewhere? It's not so easy. You close your eyes, maybe you don't feel anything. Maybe you feel your heartbeat. Maybe you don't even feel that. When I close my eyes, I'm not unable to perceive my own heartbeat. So, it's as if there's something that's blocking us there. We're not able to really go inside, even though we put our attention on the heart. So what is this? It's as if this presence is sort of enclosed in a cocoon of some kind. It becomes impenetrable. And this in the yogic uh, philosophy is something which is a result of something called samskara, or impressions, that, which we form on a day-to-day -day basis. And the example which Daji generally uses to explain impressions is when you're, let's say, sitting on an airplane. Sitting on an airplane, everybody's boarded, or everybody's in the process of boarding, and you're sitting there in the aisle seat, and you have nothing to see except the people who are walking in one after the other. And what do you do at that time? You form impressions about them. You form judgments about them. You react to their presence in either a positive or a negative way. So you may say something very specific to yourself. This person looks like a nice person. It's a positive thought. You may say this person looks like a jerk. It's a negative thought. Whatever the specifics of this impression you have about this person, it's either positive or negative. It's a reaction to their presence. And a reaction is always positive or negative, or else it's neutral. And that's not a reaction at all. That's just witnessing. So when we have reactions, these positive and negative emotions that are attached to our observations, as a result of these reactions, they don't actually leave us. The person walks by. But the actual effect of that reaction, that emotion, it stays with us. And we'll know that. We'll be able to recognize that because later on, in a similar situation, if you see somebody who looks the same or who reminds you of that person in some way, now without ever speaking to this second person, you'll all of a sudden associate this person with the first guy. And you'll treat him as if you were going to treat the first person. You'll think of him in the same way. Now, you're not really seeing either of these people. You're just making associations based on this sort of emotional memory that you've created for yourself. So, that's what an impression is. Impression is sort of a stored, a stored emotional content of a memory. Whether conscious or unconscious, it remains within you, and now becomes a filter through which you see the world, through which you respond to the world, not as the world is, but according to these biases that you formed already. So this is something which leads to prejudice, leads to all kinds of problems. And this is what samskara is, that you see written about in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, Swami, Vivekananda, everybody speaks about samskara. But how to remove samskara so that we can remove these filters and perceive the world clearly as it is. So this is something which is not so common found. In fact, I've never found it anywhere. I ask you, please go find a method to remove some scars. See if one exists. I have not been able to find it anywhere. I know that we have such a method here, in this heart pulse one. And a very simple method, easily pra practiced, in which you remove them in bulk. Remove so many filters, remove so much burden and heaviness. And you may not know exactly which impression am I removing today. You won't have that. But you'll feel so light after you finish this process, this, which we do on a daily basis. You'll feel so light. You'll feel, you won't have realized how burdened you were until you can compare it to the lightness that you feel afterwards. Because you can verify it yourself. Because that's what spirituality is all about. You verify yourself what the truth is. It doesn't matter what anybody else tells you. 
So this is about transcending belief. Transcending the need for belief via personal experience. Because as Daji says so often, must I believe in the stars or the moon or the sun? It's not something you need to believe in, you see it. So belief is only necessary in the absence of personal experience. And with personal experience, belief becomes redundant. So let's move into the realm of experience and move beyond this, this oscillation between doubt and belief, which so many people are trapped in for their whole lives. And one of the ways to do this is by experiencing yogic transmission, which I only ever explain in one way, and that is by comparing it to the fact that we say that oxygen, or air rather, is around us at all times, but we don't experience it without a breeze. We feel the breeze and we say, aha, now you felt it move. But until then, you didn't experience it. Same thing, everyone says God is omnipresent. You experience that? So, in the same way, something needs to wake us up to that presence. Now, in yoga transmission, when someone is able to trigger that sort of vibrancy, but you're now able to experience that, this sort of animation, like we say, of this divine essence. You feel it, it's, you feel it with the heart. And because of that, because you feel it, now you've moved into experience. And now you say, okay, now I know. So this is something which is offered in this heartfulness approach. We have many trainers, thousands, I think 10,000 trainers, we're all able to trigger this yoga transmission on behalf of the aspirant, on behalf of the meditator. And of course such training is offered free of cost. This is just a basic thing for us. There is no question of charging any money for anything in this realm. As Daji says in the book, God is not for sale. And if God was for sale and you could afford you could afford to pay the price, then why would you even need God? If you can afford to pay it, then you don't need you're somehow now you're above God if you can afford that. So you can't ever charge for spirituality. You can't ever charge money. It's a basic principle, so therefore, as a result of that, you don't see any monks or nuns among us. Everybody here, they have to live, they have to eat. So they have their own professions. They earn their own money in their own ways, just like anybody else. They have families also. We live in society as members of society, aspiring to be productive members of society. And also, those who elect to be trainers, who volunteer to be trainers, also perform that service. It's just a service, you know? And we don't classify it as being higher or lower than anything. Washing dishes is a service. Anything that helps is a service. So in that respect, in that attitude, they perform their work. And as a result, we can sit and experience this wondrous thing, this yogic transmission. So this is really what the basis of our heartfulness for me. And this is all described in this book, of course in which is a sort of a record of conversations between myself and Daji, in which I ask him a lot of questions. And, you know, and he speaks about his experiences and conveys the wisdom gleaned from those experiences in the course of his own life. So that's my long answer. <laughs> I think I'll just wait after the next question. I don't know if there is a second question. I'm not confident. I really don't think we need a second question. We should. Pankaj ji, media puche ek We should just be thankful that uh, they have discovered, uh, rediscovered Patanjali and interpreted it back to us so we can use it and it's pretty direct what, what he said and it's pretty evident that it's something that works and uh, we should all get on to it. I mean, I mean the ones who haven't as yet. Uh, let the media ask question. Our uh, 
स्पेशली फिल्म मेकिंग के वक्त आपका जो इंटरेक्शन हुआ है एक्टरों से तो उस उसके बारे में कुछ बताइए किस वेरी लॉन्ग आंसर पर बट आई वांट ब्रीफ में बताइए सर सी द थिंग इज के देयर आर डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ फिल्म्स दैट आई डू लाइक जैसे मैंने कहा कि बनारस मिस्टिक लव स्टोरी इज अ वेरी नॉन कमर्शियल फिल्म ऑन स्पिरिचुअलिटी एंड दिस कृष्ण मूर्ति महाकाल बाबा जी बेसिक स्टोरी बिटवीन अ ब्राह्मण गर्ल एंड अन टचेबल मैरिज तो उसमें इट्स अ डिफरेंट टोटली डिफरेंट एक्सपीरियंस फ्रॉम से डूइंग अ चिल्ड्रंस फिल्म विच आई जस्ट डिड विच इज अ डिटेक्टिव फिल्म एज फार एज दैट इज कंसर्न आई थिंक दिस अ लॉट ऑफ स्पिरिचुअलिटी दैट गोज इन टू क्रिएटिविटी स्पेशली वेन यू आर डूइंग म्यूजिक और यूर थिंकिंग ऑफ अ स्टोरी देर इज समथिंग विच आई मैंशन कॉल्ड आकाशिक रिकॉर्ड्स विच एट द फिजिकली आई थिंक बाई द एज ऑफ फोर्टी आर हार्ट स्पेशलिस्ट विल से दैट द मेमरी इज फुल After that, whatever you store, something is, has to be excluded from the brain. It physically doesn't have that much space. So, what you actually access is from the Akashic records, which is the record of everything that has happened, will happen, and is happening. So, in creativity, there is a lot of connection, as we will know, working with Rahman with the Akashic records, because it just comes from beyond. Especially when you are playing on the keyboard, you are thinking of a story. The whole story comes in a flash. You have not done anything. Where is it going? So, that is for me spirituality. Another thing which I will tell you is that what what happened to Buddha that night when he got to, enlightened, he went through 500 lifetimes and his mind dropped and then he didn't talk for 12 days. Is that your mind drops yourself, which is which is the ego, which prevents you from connecting with the beyond that drops, and that is what cinema does to you. When you go into a cinema, you're gone. You are the man up there. You are inside that. so that also is a part of spirituality many will argue with me about that but i think it is a part of the process so there is a big connection between creative there are people who are bankers there are people who are doctors there are people who are creative i think we all from different uh, parts of the universe so there is a lot of spirituality in creativity also painting singing some of the classical singers of ours when they sing they connect straight to the almighty आपकी बहुत लंबा है इसका आंसर मैं यही रुक जाता सर इन दैट सेंस कैन वी आल्सो से दैट द लेट श्रीदेवी जी हैड अ स्पिरिचुअल कनेक्ट विद अवर ऑडियंस ऑफ कोर्स ऑफ कोर्स बिकॉज़ इफ यू स्पेंड टाइम विद योर फैमिली इन यू हैव अ लाइफ टाइम ऑफ से 70 इयर्स यू हैव अ ब्रदर सिस्टर एंड दे ऑल इन योर मार्ट हार्ट्स एंड माइंड्स एंड व्हेन दे पास अवे यू फील वेरी बैड अबाउट इट सो शी वाज अ पार्ट ऑफ द फैमिली ऑफ द इंडियन ऑडियंस because she has taken you through so many experiences of emotions so many hours of emotions from sadma to this to that and all the languages that she is a part of your mind and she is like a part of your family that is why when she died there was a kind of a sadness that's why all the people uh, came there because if you differentiate that is your real experience in aradhana if rajesh khanna died you feel bad for him you are feeling bad for a family member you are crying it's real emotion it is not fake Okay. We would, you know, I was there to teach violin, Western classical violin. This was a while back now. It's not so recent. So I did that during the daytime, and whenever he required uh, a violin solo, any project, I was often called, and that would happen late at night. And all the work was being done after midnight, and anybody who was there to record anything, there would be a lot of coffee going. Everyone was up past their bedtimes, so that was always a, a unique experience, I would say. And uh, I would also say that this example that was just given about when a person loses themselves, going to see a cinema, I mean, going to the cinema and going to see a movie there. Even just yesterday, I gave the same example in some other location in Mumbai, and I was 
I'm in complete agreement. He said, people may disagree with me on this, he said, but I, not me. I agree with him wholeheartedly on this. I think that we're always trying to lose ourselves somehow, lose this self-consciousness, go beyond ourselves. And we try to do this in so many ways and through so many experiences. A lot of times, though, we get frustrated because we expect to find the infinite in the mundane. You know? We try to lose ourselves in mundane experiences and we found, find that we're not able to do so completely. Temporarily, yes, but then that experience ends and we're thrown back to ourselves again. So it all depends on the object of your, shall we say, meditation. You know? And when you can find an infinite object, endless object in which you can lose yourself forever, then that's another story. Okay. Uh Pankaj ji, khabre aa rahe the ki aap Priyanka Chopra ke saath bhi judne wale ek film mein unke production house ke saath to kuch pushti karna chahenge uske bare mein? I think, I think this Hello? Hello? Yeah, I think this is a round platform for that question. We are discussing the book and anything uh, connected to spirituality. Uh, there was a reference to your Vashist. Vashist. Yeah, yeah. That was very good. We all know what your Vashist is. I don't know how many of you have read it. But that, that's... Uh, I would like to say something about that. This is... Uh, I mean, it's so long. <laughs> it's an enormous book. And... Uh, I think there's only one English translation that I'm aware of. And I haven't read the whole thing. Uh, you have, okay. Wow. So I think this is a... Uh, this is where, you know, a lot of the basis or concepts that you find in yoga about things like consciousness, subtle bodies, you know, manas, chit, ahankar, buddhi, places where you find some of the earliest references to these concepts is Yoga Vashishtha. Yoga Vashishtha is actually a book uh, of what uh, Ram at the age of 17 was uh, finding the message to life and he was not finding maybe when he was depression. So his father got him Vashishtha to talk to him. That, that book is about what Vashishtha taught Ram at the age of 17. That is what he was mentioned. Any more questions? Joshua, Joshua, uh, Joshua, what inspired you to write this book, The Heartfulness Way? Sure, I'll tell you that. I just found the, the reference to this Yoga Vashit. It says, in Yoga Vashit, it says, by means of sight, by means of word, by means of touch, the one who can infuse divinity in the disciple and enlighten him is indeed the real guru. So in many yogic stories, we hear situations where this happens. The guru glances at a disciple, something happens, they can become awakened, right? And, you know, you see this in a lot of traditions. I won't name them now. Some of them are listed in the book. And it's so you often see by means of glance, as it said here, by means of touch. But in our approach, you don't use any of those things. It's by thought, by thought alone, that this occurs, this yogic transmission. And even thought isn't necessary because it happens so naturally and so automatically. Inside like just happens. So, anyway, um, how did this book come about? What inspired you to write the Hatha? Daji inspired me to write this Hatha okay. book. Wait, look. Yeah. He, he, he called one day and asked me to write a book. And then I thought, who's going to buy a book that I write? Nobody. So I was saying to him, can you, why don't you write a book? <laughs> and so we ended up, we didn't come to any conclusion on the matter as to how this book would, what would happen with this book. But we talked a lot about what should go in the book, what this book should be about. So those talks and those conversations with us, well, that's what the book, be, that, you know, they became the book. So. <laughs> The preamble to the book that's going to come finally? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't have that answer either. I have a question. Yes. 
kept saying that we all seem to be working in our daily lives. And someone is, everybody's doing what you're doing in the society. So common man always has a concept that if you're into spiritual, you tend to give up your worldly uh, duties. You tend to reduce your worldly duties. Then you start detaching. Because desirelessness equals spirituality. So how do you think this fits in the Mumbai comes like. I don't understand actually always where people get this notion that you have to that you have to uh, not fulfill your duties in order to be spiritual. It seems like a contradiction. I mean, everyone knows, everyone reads Gita here, and what does Lord Krishna talk about other than duty? So how is it that people have the idea that you give up the duty and all of a sudden that becomes spiritual? That's why I'm not able to understand. I mean, he called it skill in action. So what action are you taking in life that you have to be skilled in? If you don't have any duty at all, what does this skill mean? What is the relevance of skill? So, no, so I think detachment, one of, in our lineage, one of our gurus, we call him Sri Ramchandra, we call him Babuji Maharaj, right? He didn't recommend, he never recommended detachment. He said we should avoid undue attachment. Undue attachment. Meaning, there's a level of attachment which is due. But then there's also undue attachment. That's excessive and unnecessary. And that will not help us at all. So we have to be guided by the sense of duty. But who's going to tell us what the duty is? That's another question. Where will we know that from? Again, this concept of receiving guidance from within. Because you'll find a thousand people who will tell you what your duties are, right? Husband, wife, everybody will tell you what your duties are. But you have to really know from here. I, I think to answer that, uh, I was fortunate enough to have a good experience with the Kalki Oneness coming south. And I had a great experience and I begged him, I said, give me this permanently on a high scale. He said, I can give you, but then you'll be useless. You sit under a palm tree, you will be full of joy, you will not do what you come here for. You have to do these movies which are spiritual based and communicate to people. There's a lot of job you have to do. So don't be selfish and say, desireless, sit under a tree and I'm Buddha. So your path is there, which will have minefields, it will have uh, ups and downs, but you have to go through that. And when uh, Shamcharan Lehri, we all, I don't know if you know who he is, he is Mahatavadi. Yeah. Yeah. He yes, was the sir, the lady 61 he met him. So he told, when Ramchandran Lahiri met him and he gave him the experience, he said, okay, great. He said, not great, you have to go to Banaras, do a government job, have a family, go through the whole process, go through life. So he made him go through that. And then of course, Venkatesha Giri and then Yogananda was his, so that whole process. Yeah, so he also did all his duties, he didn't sit desireless. And uh, to answer your Priyanka question, yes, I, I pitched a story to her. Let's see what she says. Abhi pucha to boli rata hoon. Abhi pucha to boli rata hoon. Nei, Dilli to khana hai ka... I just made a short film called Skin of Marble, which is based on Monto's story, which is with Nasir, isn't it? It's quite a hard hitting film. In that, there is a song which says that Rab dil mein vasta, then why does Rab hurt the heart? They say na ke Rab and every... God is in your heart, and why does he hurt the heart? This is about a bro lo lover is singing that. So it's there in that, so the reference to heart being hurt, in spite of it being uh, the residence of the divine. So, can I say that one more thing? Uh, Sri Ramchandra Lahiri was the You know, I don't, I don't think, may I just say, I don't think you, see, then, then you see it from a distance, you see it as a play. The whole Maya existence is just another play, it's another story, then you can distance yourself. 
and being in it. That is the joy of being born as a human being. Buddha said to be born as a human is a coincidence of a turtle in the ocean and you throw a ring in some ocean and the turtle's neck comes into that. That is the coincidence of you being born in a human form. You should be so thrilled you are as a human. You, we are the only species that can experience ourselves. When we look in the mirror, we know it is us. No animal does that. Even a child till age 20 months doesn't know that that is me in the mirror. We are the only, if one species of gorilla does that. No, no, no one else knows that experience of self. Could be, yeah, could be. So that, we are very fortunate about as humans to rise, on, we are in the middle level, we have to rise from here. And these are the doors that have been given to us to rise in front of us. I can't praise you more. <laughs> you can try. Just kidding. Experience by having experienced this meditation? Experience it right now. You see, I mean, with this, mess, with this, we start. We meet with a trainer. We meet with a trainer, and uh, and we, we begin like that. You know, it's given like this. We always receive this method from a heartfelt trainer. And if that's not possible for us to meet them in person, we also have an app. Can you believe it? We have a meditation app called Let's Meditate. And with this app, you can actually remotely connect with the trainer anywhere else in the world at that moment. You click, this, you tap this button and you say, okay, I want to, meaning, you know, I want to experience this meditation with your wave transmission. So you hit this button on the Let's Meditate app and somewhere in the world, the trainer gets a notification on their phone and they say, okay, let's, now we'll meditate together. And they click the thing and you start until it tells you that it's over. And this is some kind of lower technology compared to yoga transmission, actually. So that's one way you can do it, in the comfort of your own home, or wherever you may be. And another way, if you want to, you can go to the heartfulness.org website. There you can find the trainer near you. Heart spots, they're called, yes, heart spots. Or you can talk to any one of us afterwards. Because this room is filled with trainers, I think. <laughs> it's been really nice uh, speaking with you today. And it's been an honor to sit next to you. I've really enjoyed myself. Advertiser for innovative outdoor solutions. Global as a company, it has never compromised on its service quality and commitment. And that is the reason our clients do keep on coming again and again to us for our service. The mission of the company is to rise on the graph of betterment for every campaign handled by us. Sir, 
आपकी फिल्म द ग्रेट लीडर आ रही है इस पर कुछ रोशनी डालिए रोशनी लीडर के साथ अपने आप चलती है और हम क्या रोशनी डालेंगे उसके ऊपर एक बहुत ही अच्छा विषय है इस फिल्म का महिलाओं के प्रति जो है समाज में आजकल और कई गांवों में कई क्षेत्रों में अत्याचार होता है उनको बढ़ावा नहीं दिया जाता इसी के दायरे में ये कहानी बनी गई है हीरो के पिता की भूमिका हम निभा रहे हैं और हमारी पत्नी जया जो है वो हमारी पत्नी का रोल कर रहे हैं तो ये एक हिंदी वर्जन है तो मुझे बड़ा गर्व है कि मैं इस फिल्म में काम कर रहा हूँ द ग्रेट लीडर फिल्म के निर्माता दीपक सावंत हैं जो पिछले 45 वर्षों से आपके मेकअप आर्टिस्ट हैं लोग जानना चाहते हैं कि शूटिंग पर दीपक सावंत आपकी नज़र में मेकअप आर्टिस्ट होते हैं या निर्माता ये मेकअप आर्टिस्ट पहले मेकअप हमारा करते हैं उसके बाद ये निर्देशक बन जाते हैं इस फिल्म की सफलता के लिए आप दर्शकों से क्या कहना चाहेंगे ग्रेट लीडर जो है वो जा करके देखें और मैं उम्मीद करता हूं कि आपको पसंद आएगी और आपको सराहनीय लगेगी दीपक जी की फिल्म के लिए ग्लोबल एडवर्टाइजर्स ने बहुत सपोर्ट किया है इस पर आप क्या कहना चाहेंगे हाँ हाँ जिन लोगों ने इनको सपोर्ट किया है उनको हम धन्यवाद देते हैं और इसी तरह उनको सहायता बनी रहे ताकि ऐसी फिल्मों का प्रचार हो और उनको हमारी तरफ से बहुत बहुत शुभकामनाएं और अभिनंदन और स्नेह और आदर ग्लोबल एडवर्टाइजर फॉर इनोवेटिव आउटडोर सोल्यूशन